one additional component to think about, which is everything I've just said has been oriented around all this limbic system stuff built around eventually influencing the hypothalamus and thus eventually increase influencing the entire world of hormones or of the autonomic nervous system. This is this unidirectional picture. Stuff starts in the brain and you have outcomes throughout the body. What is just as important is all the ways in which stuff going on in the body will influence limbic function, completing this circle. And an awful lot of that information is the autonomic nervous system not going in this direction, but going in this direction. Now, what this brings up is a classic theory that's been in psychology since around 1900 or so called the James Lang theory of emotion, named for William James and Lang, whoever that was. That may have been his puppy. But the James Lang theory of emotion goes as follows. Here's how you feel an emotion. It is not the case that your brain decides it's feeling an emotion based on sensory information coming in, memory, whatever. The brain decides it's feeling an emotion and tells the body, let's speed up the heart, let's breathe faster, let's sweat, whatever it is. That's not how emotion works. Here's how emotion works. Stimulus comes into your brain, and before you consciously process it, your body is already responding with heart rate, with blood pressure, with pupillary contractions, whatever. How do you figure out what emotion you are feeling? You are getting information back from the periphery telling you what's going on down there. In other words, how do you figure out you're excited? Whoa, if I'm suddenly breathing real fast and my heart's beating fast, it must be because I feel, ex oh, I feel excited now. Ridiculous, totally absurd way in which you could process stuff, completely inefficient, and over the years, after decades of being wildly discredited, more and more evidence that that is some of how emotion is based, your brain being influenced by your bodily state to decide what emotions it's feeling. Number of examples. First one, one of those hormones that just has emotion written all over it, adrenaline. Adrenaline, epinephrine, epinephrine associated with arousal of the sympathetic nervous system. So what happens when you dump some epinephrine into the nervous system? What does it do to the brain? What does it do to the limbic system? What does it do to the sort of behaviors influenced by it? And greatest demonstration, this was a classic study in the 60s, a guy named Stanley Schachter doing a study that you could not do again on humans with current rules. But here's what he did. He gave people epinephrine, adrenaline, without them knowing it. Okay less paperwork in those days, but here's what the one version of the classic experiment was. Somebody comes in and they believe what they're doing is some study of you take this vitamin and does it change the way you do Sudoku or something and like that was just the teaser, that was the distractor. We've taken this pill which actually contained, contained long-acting epinephrine. Then you're going to go into the study where you're going to get tested or whatever the task is and please sit down in the waiting room for a while. And the actual experiment took place in the waiting room. Sitting there in the waiting room was another individual, a confederate of Schachter, somebody working on the experiment. In half the cases, what the person sitting there was supposed to do was say, I can't believe it. I was supposed to go in. They said, I have a 1 o'clock appointment for this. It is 1.30 already. I'm going to miss my class. My car is going to get towed. I'm totally pissed off. I can't believe these people are doing it. Meanwhile, half the time, the other person is sitting there saying, God, I love these psych studies. You do a lot of them. I love doing these ones. I had such a cool one last week. Which dorm are you in? Let's, and off it goes. And the very, the key thing being totally different emotional states, in each case being exposed to someone in a very emotionally aroused, agitated, expressive state. And what did Schachter show? Does epinephrine make you get more angry? Does epinephrine make you get more friendly? It doesn't do either. It's modulatory. What epinephrine does is it kicks up the fevered level of whatever emotion you were socially being brought into. 
And thus what you got was the subject sitting there soaked in epinephrine while somebody is like going on about how late it is and these people, before you know it, they're up there banging on the counter at the receptionist and saying this is an outrage and this is unfair and all of that, getting caught up in it. Meanwhile, the other one, within like five minutes, he's singing frat songs with this person and there and they're going to get together for dinner and they're hugging each other. And what does epinephrine do? It does not cause a behavior. It exaggerates, it magnifies emotional states that have been provoked for other reasons. It modulates the exact same concept as the other day. What does GABA do to that neuron A? It does nothing whatsoever. What GABA does is it modulates the ability of this glutamatergic neuron to talk to A. What does epinephrine do? Does it create any emotions? Not at all. What it does is jack up the intensity of whatever emotions your social circumstances have generated. Another example of James Lang sort of stuff. Okay. So you were sitting around and you were terribly anxious and you go to a clinician and the person decides to give you what class of drugs do we know endlessly by now? Benzodiazepines. They give you some Valium to decrease your anxiety. Meanwhile, across town, there's somebody who has a big gymnastics competition on Sunday, whatever, and they've pulled a muscle, they've been having muscle spasms, and this is really a problem. So they go to their clinician who gives them a muscle relaxant benzodiazepines, the exact same dose. So wait a second, here's somebody taking Valium for anxiety, and here's somebody taking Valium to relax their muscles. What's up with that? It's the exact same thing. And it is a very James Lang moment. What's part of anxiety about? It's monitoring the level of tension in your body. It's getting feedback from muscle tone. And that's one of the ways in which anti-anxiety drugs like benzodiazepines work because you're sitting there and you're saying things are just as horrible as they were an hour ago, but I am so relaxed, I'm like dripping out of this chair here, it must not be so bad. Part of you deciding is monitoring the muscle tone in your body coming back with autonomic information. That's where you break the cycle. That's why the same drug decreases anxiety and is a muscle relaxant. More examples of this. One is what's going on with meditation. That's what biofeedback taps into. So you're sitting there and you're suffering from high blood pressure. Translated into our terms, something here is driving blood pressure to be increased too much. It's not necessarily that. It could also be blood vessels, but we'll put it on a brain basis here for the moment. So you got a choice between taking drugs or doing some meditational something that you want to hook up to biofeedback to make it more effective. Here's what you do. They sit you down and they wire you up so that they can monitor your blood pressure and you sit there and they say, okay, I want you to relax and focus and focus on the best day of your life. Let's see what happens to blood pressure. Nothing much. Okay, focus on your favorite piece of music. Nothing much. Okay, focus on your favorite piece of music that's kind of slow and dreamy. What, and suddenly the monitor goes this way, the person's blood pressure has just dropped 10 points. And then you say, stop, wait a second, what did you just think about? Think about it again, and it does it again. And what the person begins to learn at this point is what aspects of meditative states, what aspects of memory, whatever, suddenly allow the brain to be regulating blood pressure. What's going on there? You're using this machine to send the signal up there. Part of what's also going on is feedback that way. So another version of one of these loops. More versions of loops. Here's one that probably accounts for 90% of the arguments between significant others on this planet. Okay, so you and your significant other are behaving, interacting in a primate, social, biological way, and one of you does something that totally outrages the other one, and they're furious at you, he says personifying, and they're furious, and what's going on, and they convince you readily that you're at fault, and in fact, this was a horrible thing you did, and they're all agitated, and you apologize, and you make it sound like you really mean it, because you really mean it, and you apologize, and great, and they finally say, okay, okay, I accept your apology, don't do it again, it's all sorted out, it's over with, it's done, 
And then you begin to think, okay, great, we're out the other end of the woods there. Things are just fine now. Things are... And suddenly they remember something miserable you did to them in 1968. And they suddenly remember it in every possible detail and want to argue about it all over again. What's going on there? What we have is another James Lang moment when you get into an aroused, angry state, and then it's all over with afterward. That's great because the person has apologized. So cognitively, you have just adjusted things. Yes, they recognize they did the wrong thing. Good, I'm vindicated. That's great. It's settled now. It's perfect. And you could do that in a second. The trouble is it takes a long time. It takes minutes now for your sympathetic nervous system and its consequences to completely coast back to baseline. So you're sitting there and the problem has been solved, but your heart is still racing and what do you have? A James Lang moment there sitting there saying, okay, well, I was really upset about that, but that's just sorted out and that's all taken care of, except I'm still feeling totally agitated. It must be for some reason. Ah, oh, it's what that person did to me in the second Roosevelt administration. And suddenly out it comes out. It's this James Lang loop there of the physiological information coming back there, prompting one into trying to find a cognitive explanation for it. There must be a reason why I am still hyperventilating. Oh, this must be the reason. This thing we need to go over also. Okay, I'm going to give one factoid here, and you can do with it what you will, but there is a pronounced gender difference in how long it takes after strong sympathetic arousal for things to go back to baseline. Okay, let's just get a show of hands here. Uh, who guesses that it takes longer to get back to baseline in males? Okay, well, unless there's a lot of uh, abstainers here, I think we're, okay, females, yeah. Yes, there is a pronounced gender difference in that, and there's another realm in which you have that same pronounced gender difference, which is after orgasm. Males go back to baseline a lot faster than females do, and that explains a whole world of, like, you know, he wants to go out and get noodles and peanut sauce, and she wants to cuddle and talk and all that sort of thing. And why can't it expect? And it's James Lang's damn fault that that sort of thing goes on. Okay, so we there have another example of these feedback loops. A couple more. Here's an amazing thing. You take somebody with a clinical depression and you force them mechanically to take a somatic state that mediates different emotions and signifies other emotions. What am I talking about? You take the person with depression and you say, you are going to mechanically go through the process with your facial muscles of smiling again and again and again. And you force somebody to do that for a half hour or so intermittently and they feel better afterward. The world is just as depressing as it was 30 minutes before, but there's something going on here saying, if I am getting feedback saying I'm doing this thing with my muscles here and I'm doing it a lot, it must not be so bad. Other studies showing you take somebody and either they are slumped in a chair or you have them sitting up erect and you tell them the score that they got on a test that you just gave them before that and it's a very good score and what you see is the more straight and upright the person is sitting, afterward the more they will assess themselves as being made happy by the result they got and being made to feel proud. 